Good morning, everyone. That was beautiful. I love to hear that back. I don't always get that from my congregation in New York. Can I say it again? Good morning. It's really good to be with you. My name is Michael, and uh, you might have seen me on the bulletin. Uh, that was my introduction to you. Um, but I'm so grateful to be here. Uh, I used to work with uh, Park Cities. Um, it's hard to believe it was seven years ago, seven years ago in August. So time has flown. We have uh, been in New York City for seven years, and uh, it is one of the great joys of our life to call you uh, as a church family home, uh, that you are ascending church, um, that you loved us and believed us. Um, we, we have come across this saying that's really shaped us, which is that relationships are the stuff of destiny. Um, those Think about your life, the relationships that were serendipitous that God put in your life that shaped your destiny as a person, as a family, and you as a church have certainly left your mark on me and you've left your mark on our family. Um, as I reflect on our story, I was deeply shaped the five years that I was here with you. Uh, you poured into me, you taught me, uh, you gave me valuable feedback. Um, you inspired me and believed in me. One of the things that inspired me about this church was when the 75th anniversary was being celebrated, and I looked at the cover of the book, and do you remember the title of the book? It was called, oh, really familiar with your own 75-year uh, history anniversary. Um, there ought to be a church. There ought to be a church. And I think Jeff referenced it last week that Dr. Truitt, uh, back in the day, looked at this part of the city and said there ought to be a church there. And I remember thinking to myself, that is filled with such enthusiasm and vision and creativity. It's the entrepreneurial spirit that says that doesn't exist and it should. And as we were exploring the next phase of our life, we were looking at New York and we started visiting neighborhoods and we came uh, across a neighborhood in Tribeca. And Tribeca is in lower Manhattan. It is uh, right above the World Trade Tower. It sits just north of the World Trade Tower. And uh, as we were walking through that neighborhood, we had that sense in us that there ought to be a church here. It was an old manufacturing uh, uh, neighborhood uh, before it was a, uh, a dwelling neighborhood. And uh, because of that, there were no church buildings. And as we walked the streets, we realized there, there is a significant absence here that we feel called to step in and help add our voice and our time to fill. And so we thank you so much for believing in us, for fanning the flame of that. And uh, as we got there, just shortly after we arrived in New York, we realized there not only needs to be a church here, but there really ought to be queso. Um, <laughs> it does not exist in New York. It is salsa and guacamole all over the place, no queso, and it's a tragedy. Um, so we're trying to remedy that as well. Um, but it's, it's still going to be here. And before we actually um, consider the topic for the day, which is also serendipitous. Today we're exploring what does it mean to engage our city? What does it mean to um, love our city and be a church for our city? And as we consider uh, this question, I'd like to take a moment just to pause. Um, we do this in our church every week, and uh, we always have stories coming out of it of how God uses that small space to operate in people's hearts. And it's just a, a moment of quiet. Um, we, we invite people to just, let's be quiet in God's presence and open ourselves to the possibility that God would speak to us, that God would take this story that we explore today and connect it to our story. Um, and so as best as you know how, with whatever you bring into the room, whether it's a lot of faith or a lot of doubt, uh, we invite you to bring your whole self to this moment and thereby make it holy. Um, so let's do that together. Let's just take a quiet moment to open our hearts to God and to his word. Maybe as we sit here in the quiet, you focus on your breath. Often what makes a moment holy is our presence, that we are fully present. So pay attention to, to yourself, how you're feeling, what you're bringing into the room. And ask God to meet you where you are. God, you know our hearts. Open them to you. Give us what we need today. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, let's send good vibes to the clicker and make sure it works. It does, good. All right, so we are uh, talking today about what's next, our city. And we're going to be looking at 
uh, the book of Acts, which the book of Acts is fascinating to me. It is a 30-year window into how the world was transformed, turned upside down. And today we focus in on Acts 17, which is a particular scene in this 30-year window that I think has significant implication for what it means to engage a city. It certainly shaped what we're doing in New York, and I want to offer you a couple of reflections from the story. Three, uh, to be specific, because all sermons should have three points. Um, so, Acts 17, we, uh, we want to ask this question, what does it mean to be a church for the city? And I want to offer you reflections out of our story as a church, so that you get to know a little bit about our story. And I want to offer them uh, from this story that we read about Paul in the city of Athens. So it begins with uh, three observations. The first is that in order to engage our city and be a church for the city, I think we have to be willing to become the change that we want to see. When you look at Dallas and you think of its problems, when you think of its challenges, when you think of its shadow, um, how are you in your own life willing to engage transformation, willing to become the change that you want to see? Um, our text opens up with Paul in Athens, and he's just waiting around. He's waiting for his friends. And as he's waiting around, he's walking around the city, paying attention to what he sees. And you get this text. It says, now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. His spirit was provoked within him as he walked around and he saw that the city was full of idols. Now, Paul, he has a history. And you know, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the, the Bible, you know Paul's sort of turnaround story. Um, now, what do we call it when someone kills another human being in the name of their religion or their God? What do we call that? You can talk back to me. This is, a, 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 this is interactive. Terrorism, yeah, we would call that terrorism, and rightly so. That is an act of terror, to take a life in the name of, especially heinous, in the name of God or your religion. And yet this is exactly what Paul was engaged in doing. Paul was the kind of person who would go into a city, go into a town, step into a community. He would observe what he thought was blasphemy, what he thought was idolatry, what he thought was ungodliness. And he was outraged. And in his outrage, he aided, abetted, and actively spread a form, what we would call religious terrorism. And this is his instinct. This was his zeal. Uh, to him, this was the expression of fidelity, of faithfulness, until he literally got knocked off his high horse. He's on the road to Damascus, to another city, and he's, he's actively persecuting this emerging new group that, that we know now as the church. And as he's on his way to Damascus, he has uh, an audiovisual experience. Um, visual, by the way, if he goes blind. And he hears a voice with the, the beaming of a light, and a, a question is posed to Paul. Do you remember that question? Why do you persecute? Why do you persecute? And Paul became one of the greatest Christian engagers of cities that we have ever known because he dared to, enter the, and to entertain the question, why? Why? What is underneath your dysfunctional, unhealthy, neurotic behavior? Like, what's underneath your bad habits? What's underneath the problems of your life? And this sends Paul into a tailspin. Remember, he spends three years in Arabia trying to reconnect the dots. Like, for him, this moment is life-shattering. It's new paradigm. He knows it's good news. He knows this is hopeful and there is a joy in him. But there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of dissonance. There's a lot of, uh, what does life even mean? Who is God in any ways? And what does this mean for my life? It takes him three years to put those pieces together as he entertains that question, Why? And this is because Paul was committed to the work of personal transformation. Paul opened his heart. He opened his life to becoming the change that he wanted to see in the world. And when he got whiff of good news, of a different vision, of a different understanding of the good life that Jesus called the kingdom of God, 
it awakened in him the courage to change and to ask that question. It kind of produced the, kind of the person who could say later, you know, we see through a glass dimly. We see through a glass dimly. What a contrast to arrogant Saul who traveled around, saw things in black and white, knew who was in or who was out, and knew how to deal with it. Now, this is a different Paul, a Paul who's been softened. He's been shaped by the love of God, by the grace of God, and he now sees through a different lens. He starts to taste what Jesus said when he said, listen, I don't desire sacrifice. I desire mercy from the prophet Hosea. Paul, Jesus taught it twice, and Paul starts to get the hang of that. Okay, this is what God is about. This is what God wants. And so Paul, like the Pharisees in John 9, he was addicted to sight. He was addicted to certainty. He was addicted to the security that came from that, from having a tribe that was the right tribe, and he belonged to it a sense of pride and identity, of having a sense of purpose and mission. He was out there, and he was doing what he thought was best for the world, and he got stopped in his tracks. And it's often those of us who are willing to evaluate our lives at that level that make the most impact in the world because there's a substance there. We've gone through the valley of self-reflection. We have boxed with our shadows, and we've come out the other side knowing that God is love. And knowing that our mission is love. And so when it comes to this idea of becoming the change, as a church, we set out with the same kind of vision. Notice what Paul does. How does his spirit get provoked? You know, the word for, for pro- provocation is deeply distressed or um, mixed uh, views or mixed opinions about something. And he felt a war in his soul. Paul walks into Athens. He sees the idols. Old, old Paul wants to wants to do something about it. But what does new Paul do? How does new Paul respond to the outrage? If you consider our moment and our time, what do we do with an outrage culture where it is so easy to become inflamed over an idea or a policy? What does it mean in our culture where we are so easily offended by one another and we are so polarized by each other to take the posture of Paul? to walk around and to look carefully, not to jump to judgment, not to jump to persecution, not to jump with outrage, but to take a step back and look and observe and become curious before we become judgmental. This is what Paul does. He walks around and he looks carefully. Our church uh, started with uh, a handful of men who gathered at a pier uh, to pray. And this, this, this was that group of guys. This was actually our first prayer meeting. You can see there's only six, six people there. A couple showed up later, um, but that's what we had to work with to start. And we would meet at the end of the pier, and we would look out over our neighborhood as the sun rose, and we would pray for our neighborhood. All the things that we saw that were wrong or broken about our neighborhood and our city, we would pray about those things. But I'll tell you what happened. The things in our own lives, the things in our own hearts that were broken, that were dysfunctional, that we knew were getting in the way of our healing and our transformation, those were the things that started to bubble up as well in our prayers. And in addition to this prayer meeting, um, I started to prayer walk the neighborhood. And I went back to look at my calendar, and I had spent over 100 hours just walking our neighborhood, praying, looking at the sights and the sounds and the people meeting them, building relationships, asking questions like, what is this neighborhood about? What story is being lived out here? We're the home to the Tribeca Film Festival. Uh, This is the old Tribeca Cinema. I walked past that so many times, praying for the arts, asking the question, what are people saying through the arts that are coming out of this neighborhood? I walked around and noticed uh, the, the, you'll notice very quickly that in our neighborhood, there are towers. Uh, the World Trade Tower is right there, which is such a symbol. It's an icon of not only uh, our world economy, but it's an icon of our deepest fears, the things that haunt us about our world. And that's right there. And as I would walk around that tower, the tower was being constructed when we first moved there. It was completed a couple years afterwards. And I would pray, and I would channel the the angst and the emotion of our neighborhood. There were uh, shops 
I got to know the shop owners, and I became a patron like everybody else in my neighborhood, and we began to build relationships. Um, I also navigated the subway system, which was its own minor miracle. Um, and, and, and quickly, we began to get to feel for the neighborhood as we spent hours just walking around and observing, carefully observing. And that's what it means to become the change. I wonder for you how you could engage Dallas in a different way than you've been engaging Dallas. I wonder, you know, it's like wallpaper when you're used to it, you just don't see it anymore. And some of you have, you were born here and you were raised here and you see it through a certain lens. And you, you know how when you look at something and you stare at it long enough, you're, it actually disappears in your sight. Your, your eye has to shift a little bit for the image to reappear. It's a fascinating thing about our optics. And the same is true about our engagement with our cities. We can become so familiar with our cities, and we just fail to see what is happening right under our nose. And that's Paul's great gesture. Paul, as a person who has been on a journey of transformation, he himself has changed. He's had this great shift. He's able to come in the midst of his outrage and watch carefully. And I wonder for you, as you think about your engagement, and the church thinks about its engagement at the city, if you can't pause to ask this question, what does it look like for us to step back in the face of any of our outrage and say, what's actually happening here? And become curious. As a community, we started to realize, you know, uh, New York's known for its cynicism or its secularism. And uh, I started to realize, you know what? At an ideal level, I might not be as cynical or skeptical as my neighbor, but with my life I am. Um, if you look at my life and you think about your life, with our own behaviors, we suggest and express our skepticism. It's the very reason why our ideas aren't always in line with our lifestyles, because there is a great tension, there is a great battle, there's a great war happening within our hearts. And so we started to realize for us to have meaningful presence in our city and meaningful presence in our neighborhood, we have to really wrestle in our own hearts with our own skepticism. And cynicism. And so we gathered uh, the first night um, uh, uh, for a vision and prayer night. I uh, invited 60 people that I've gotten to know in the neighborhood. 35 showed up. And I got to share my story, Kindy's story, our family's story. Um, we got to invite them to talk about what excites you about the possibility of a new church. And we were excited. We were thrilled about the journey ahead. We decided to meet for brunch every other week. And over the, the, the coming months, over the nine months, uh, we broke bread together. We got to know each other. We told each other stories. And it became very clear that we had a hunger and a passion to reach our city. And yet, um, we knew in our own hearts the stumbling blocks, the challenges. And so we started to pray for each other. We started to support one another. Um, people got counseling and therapy for the first time in their life. Uh, people received love in community in the midst of their lives that were blowing up, even though on the surface everything looked really pretty. And it was a meaningful nine months when we started to experience the power of God to change us. And there was a growing confidence that if we can experience change, then maybe we can really do something significant in our neighborhood. And so we continued to meet until we were packed into loft buildings. We were cramming 90 people by the end of it. And we realized it's time to go public. 90 people should not be in a New York apartment. Um, and so we started praying, and God provided a space for us to meet in. It was the, the old Bogardus mansion. And uh, for three years, we leased two floors of uh, the Bogardus mansion. It sat 150 people. On the first day, uh, we had no idea uh, who would show up aside from our core uh, group. Um, because we didn't do any advertising, and in five years as a church, we've never done any advertising. It's all been word of mouth. It's all been grassroots. And so we actually uh, showed up Easter morning, which was our launch in 2013, and we prayed. We prayed that the change God was working in us would spill out into our neighborhood as we started a gathering and we officially started our ministry. And that morning, uh, some of you joined us. You were there. You witnessed it. You participated in it. You supported us. And uh, that morning, we actually filled the room, and it was extraordinary. Now, every week after this did not look like this, okay? We filled the room. Uh, we were over, you know, fire, we broke fire code. Um, and, uh, but after that, we started to settle into our identity, and we were a community of 100 people 
and then we grew to a community of 150, and then 200, and then 250, and then uh, to, to present time, where we're a community of uh, over 400 adults that call our church home. We average about 300 on a Sunday morning, 50 children. And honestly, numbers are numbers, but these are lives. These are stories that have been shaped by your compassion, your willingness to take action, and your support. Um, today, we wonder and we ask the question, uh, what does it mean to be Trinity Grace Church in our neighborhood? As you ask the question, what does it mean to be Park City's Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas? So we got to become the change. we got to be willing to become the change. But the second thing that I observe is, uh, you know, related to this question, how does God want to change the lens through which you experience the city? How does God want to change that? And that's what we open. And I think the next thing we see in Paul is he finds common ground. For you to be a, an effective church in Dallas, you have to be willing to, to see and search for common ground. Um, right now, we have bad habits as Americans. Our, our habit and our addiction is to find difference, locate it, isolate it, and distance ourselves from it. Right? That's our instinct. And social media has made it amplified. Um, a lot of our, our news cycles have also uh, contributed to that. But finding common ground is what Paul does here, and he shows his change. He shows his transformation. This is not the Paul that we knew uh, from earlier in the book of Acts. Notice in uh, a, few, a few noteworthy quotes here. He starts his speech this way. He says, people of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. So Paul goes from walking around the city, seeing these idols, and he's outraged or he's deeply distressed to addressing them, and complimenting them. Like, the common ground he finds is, yes, this is idolatry. Yes, I think this is a problem. This is hurting people's lives. It's damaging people's lives. It's undermining the work of love in the world. But there's something I can, I can put my finger on to compliment them, to connect with them, to find common ground. These people are on a search. They're on a quest. They really are reaching out for transcendence. They want to experience and know, or at least be connected to God or the gods. And so he finds common ground, and he says, people of Athens, I see you're very religious. When we, uh, when we uh, it was Halloween of last year when uh, the terrorist uh, event took place in New York. Um, it was, you know, at the beginning of the month, there was the shooting in Las Vegas, and on Halloween day, I picked my daughter up from school and we went through the grocery store to pick up Halloween bags. And as we were walking through the store, uh, we came out onto the West Side Highway, which is right where I live, right where our church meets. And uh, we immediately heard gunfire. Uh, I heard about nine or ten shots, rapid fire. And, you know, my low-grade consciousness was remembering Las Vegas. And so I pushed my daughter to the ground, Lucy, and I started to look around to see where the gunfire was coming from. And it was coming from about 100 yards north of where I was. And so I zigzagged back into the, the grocery store and called my wife immediately because this is the time that our kids were getting out of school. My son uh, attends school where the gunfire was coming from. And so I'm thinking to myself, oh, my goodness, like this is a, another shooting. And uh, so I call my wife, and I'm like, where's Jack? And she says, he's not here yet. Why? And I told her that we, you know, I just heard gunfire. And she was like, should I come down? Should I help you find him? And I said, no, stay there in case he gets home. Uh, I'll go and look for him. So we ended up finding uh, uh, the, the school, walked up to an officer and said, what happened? And the officer said, there's been a shooting. We don't know any details. And uh, so I went into the school where my, my son attends. They put it on lockdown, and I was stuck in there for two hours looking for my son. I couldn't find him. And then my wife eventually called me and said, Jack, just walk through the door. And it turns out he walked out of the door right at the time when the uh, uh, terrorist crashed into the bus. And he saw kids running and thought it was a prank and then eventually uh, got the idea this was serious. And he started running home and he made his way home. And we're so grateful for that. Um, but that, that incident marked me and I realized, like, what is the connection here? Um, what is the message for our neighborhood and our city at a time like this? I was asked the next morning uh, to be on Morning Joe, and I was interviewed to tell the story, and uh, they asked me, what is your message for the neighborhood as a pastor in the city? And 
I offered in the spirit of what Paul did uh, here, uh, what I see that's beautiful about New York. You know, the, the mottos that were going around on social media immediately after the terrorist attack, and really after any threat, is the hashtag New York Strong. I mean, New Yorkers pride themselves on strength, uh, persistence, resilience. And the word that I offered was like, New York is strong. We are strong. I see that you are very strong. But we have to be careful not to show a veneer of strength and not attend to our pain. And I offered wisdom from the Christian tradition to say, listen, the gospel essentially teaches us that if we don't transform our pain, we're going to be sure to transmit our pain. And so I was able to share a little bit of wisdom there in my own poor way, uh, looking in the spirit of Paul to make a connection and to find common ground. Our church has been on a journey of that. You see Paul doing it continually here. Quotes that you probably refer to as biblical quotes. For in him we live and move and have our being. That just rolls off the tongue. It's beautiful. It's inspiring. It conjures up images of God's nearness and, and all of that. But this is not the Bible, folks. Paul is quoting Epimenides. He was a Cretan philosopher. So Paul, in finding common ground, engages their philosophers. He engages their poets. And when he gets up to speak to them, he quotes their own writers. He quotes their own thinkers. And he doesn't see this as diminishing him or threatening him. He sees it as enriching and enlarging him. And it doesn't water down or compromise what he has to offer. It enriches and builds common ground. He goes on to say, we are all his offspring. And that was not original to the Apostle Paul. It's not in the Bible anywhere. This was uh, Eridus, the Stoic philosopher, written in around 200 BC. And so Paul is engaging. He's quoting these pagan philosophers, and he is building common ground. And the, the net effect of this is what? To build bridges, not walls. Right? Paul looks around. He's disturbed. He's distressed. There's a sense of outrage, and he goes to build a bridge. What would that look like for you at this time, at this cultural moment in this city, to build bridges and not build walls? To, to look to find common ground, to move toward your neighbor, to move toward your enemy, to move toward the person that you disagree with or that you don't see eye to eye with, what would that look like? And what would come of that? In New York, we've tried to do this through a thing called the Center for City Renewal, uh, which we began. And it, it seeks to address issues of justice, of civility, of vocation, and uh, it's our attempt to try to build these kinds of bridges. I was asked early on by uh, the, the uh, leader of the Ground Zero Mosque if they could use our space for prayer because they had an emergency at their building. And uh, our landlord wouldn't allow it. Um, but we kind of connected through that. And later, I asked the director out to coffee. And as we got to know each other over coffee, uh, we started connecting on just the common ground of being human. Um, he shared his story as a father his story as a husband, we shared concerns and stresses around those things. We talked about our neighborhood and what we thought was wrong or needed to be improved and how we could collaborate. Um, there was a sense in which we saw one another's humanity. I went to uh, Israel and Palestine on a peacemaking pilgrimage. I was taken there by a friend of mine who worked for the State Department under President uh, Bush. And he uh, introduced me to rabbis, and he introduced me to former generals. And we got to hear all of these stories of what it means uh, to be Israeli in this moment. And then he took me across the border to the West Bank. And we spent time with uh, his colleague, Greg's family. And though Greg is born in the U.S. and is a U.S. citizen, his family are Christian Palestinians who live in Bethlehem. And they got to share their story of what it means to be on the other side of that conflict. And it soon became clear, as both sides were introducing themselves, there was a pattern that emerged. Uh, we would be in a small room in a circle, and someone would say, hello, my name is such and such. I'm a human being. Uh, I'm also a Muslim Sikh at Al-Aqsa Mosque. And they would go on about their list. And I thought, that's curious. You're a human being. Thank you for that observation. And then we would go and we'd meet with a little rabbi in a settlement. And the rabbi would say, hello, my name is Rabbi such and such. Uh, I'm a human being. Uh, I am a, a Jewish rabbi and an uh, Orthodox rabbi. And he would go on. We went to the other side in the West Bank. And we met with refugee, people in refugee camps. And we met with people uh, who uh, had land that dates back to X. And they're just struggling to keep it going. 
And they all introduced themselves as human beings first. And I thought, what is going on here? And I realized kind of the insight that Paul has here, if we are all God's offspring, Paul has to see through that lens to see the humanity of the other so that he can really care for them and love them and serve them in the midst of their difference, in the midst of their struggle. And there is a common wisdom growing in Israel-Palestine that we have to start to see each other and identify ourselves as human first in order for there to be bridges that can be built so that we can actually hash out our differences in the context of a, a mutual dignity. And that's what Paul is doing here in Athens. He's finding common ground, building bridges, establishing a mutual respect so that what he has to offer actually is received. And then finally, well, this is an example of how we've done it. We've interviewed uh, our Muslim neighbors and leaders uh, to, to listen and say, how do you see it? How do you understand our challenges? How do you understand civility? Uh, what do you see about us that needs to change? Like, we, we got curious and built bridges. Um, I interviewed, I had the chance to interview Savannah Guthrie of the Today Show, uh, who's also a parishioner. And she, uh, we were talking about what does it mean in a, in a polarized media context uh, to try to build bridges and to try to represent mo multiple sides of an argument. Um, finding common ground. We gotta be about that. And then this is where my story gets really Forrest Gump. Uh, I got to meet with Pope Francis. And uh, that happened through a guy who visited our church and he said, you know what? What I sense the identity of your ministry in this church is that you guys are bridge builders. And uh, he said, I, I'm trying to build a coalition called John 17, which takes Jesus' prayer for unity and builds it out into the world. You remember when Jesus was praying for the church in the future and he said, uh, how will people know that God sent me. Well, they'll know it when you all are one as I and the Father are one. So, Lord, let them be one as you and I are one. And so uh, the, the purpose of this delegation was to try to build uh, unity. And this is not academic uh, ecumenism, and this is not, uh, you know, rainbows and unicorns and bad poetry. Um, we're talking about, like, real difficult relationship building at the grassroots level. And so I found myself invited to uh, the home of Pope Francis. We spent two hours with him, and I got to ask him, what, what do you see as one of the challenges of our world? And he said, I asked him, what would you prioritize as a young Christian leader? And this is what he said. He said, what I'm going to share with you is really odd because our ministry as, uh, as Christian leaders is the proclamation of the word. And he said, what I, what I think our time needs now more than ever is the ministry of the ear. The ability to listen well. That, you know, God has spoken once for all through Jesus Christ, and now he listens. And we need to listen. And we need to learn. And he said the, the, the words of someone are like a seed planted in the heart that grows over time. It softens us to each other, and it creates the soil in which we can actually have successful communication. And if our faith is all about the successful communication of the gospel of Christ, then we need to do our work and our part to build that soil where communication can take place. And so we've been on the ground building bridges. I already referenced this, so we'll move on. Uh, risk of contribution. This is the final point, and I leave you with this. Um, Paul was willing to risk a contribution having done these things, having undergone the process of change, having uh, you know, found common ground with the Athenians. He then risks a contribution, and he offers them uh, what he has to offer, which is, hey, this God that you're groping for, that you're looking for in the dark, he's not far from you. He's not far from you. you know, we think of like people's lives that we want to reach or connect with, and we might think of their lives as being just so far from God, and we, we use that language, they're so far from God. Paul doesn't see it that way. Paul looks at everyone, and he says, I see you groping. I see you reaching. God is not far from you. And he offers that God is working toward justice. God is there will be an accountability. There will be this divine accountability for all of humanity. And then he says, and by the way, that's going to come through the guy that he raised from the dead. He doesn't mention Jesus' name, no mention of the cross. G Paul is riffing in the public's forum, in the public sphere, and he's connecting the dots to their concerns, to their drives, to their fears. He risks that contribution. He does it in a political environment where he could have been ostracized. He, he could have been physically harmed. But he did it anyway. 
Now, here's what I would say to you. You gotta learn how to risk your contribution. I mean, you guys risked a contribution with us to start our church, and there's fruit born from that. And you've done that a hundredfold. But we gotta be willing to risk our contribution having done the first two things as well. And a lot of times, I think our tendency is to want to, to, to export and not import. We want to extend ourselves and not learn and be open and, and receive guidance ourselves. And so Paul is able to risk a contribution here that matters because he was willing to become a change that he wanted to see, and he was willing to find common ground. And I think you'll know that your contribution is meaningful, it's valid, it's connected to love if you're willing to do those first two steps. And so as you, as a church, imagine your future, you imagine engagement with the city, I, I want you to think about what it means to risk a contribution. And you're already doing it in beautiful ways, by the way. The way that you've partnered with the church in Oak Cliff, to build bridges there, to build mutual understanding, um, to get involved in each other's lives, that's risking a contribution. I mean, there's a sense of risk involved with that. There's a sense of uh, getting out of your comfort zone, and that's beautiful. And I think to engage the city effectively, we've all got to be willing uh, to take those risks. And so I leave you with those invitations and this final text, which is from Jeremiah 29. In Jeremiah 29, the prophet Jeremiah says to a community in exile, he says, listen, I know that you, you either you want to assimilate and make life easier or you want to just huddle in and, and be tribal. He says, I'm going to challenge you to a different posture. I want you to build houses and live in them. I want you to plant gardens, eat their produce, Take wives, have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. And then he goes on to say, and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you'll find your welfare. And this is a beautiful paradigm for city engagement. We all have to be willing to be a part of our tribes. Be, be willing to build, build this church. Build its identity. But don't seclude yourselves. Don't isolate. Engage. And also, don't assimilate. Don't just give way to the latest trends that come and go. But be thoughtful. Be curious. Be engaged in that process. And so I leave you with that as an encouragement and as a challenge. And uh, we watch you from afar and are encouraged by you and are challenged by you. And, uh, and we hope that we have many, many more years of mutual learning and growth uh, to come. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your prayers. Um, let me bless you as you've blessed us. God, we thank you for uh, our time together uh, to share this moment, to share this story. And I pray that you would move in our lives in powerful ways. Do beyond what we can imagine. Challenge us. Help us to make the most of what you've entrusted to us. Give us the grace uh, to, to fulfill our callings in our cities so that Jesus Christ can be known and people can be transformed through him. We pray that in Jesus' name. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.